Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Canola Producers Commission, SAS Canola, and Manitoba Canola Girl. Jay Strowey, Real Agriculture.com. I'm here with uh, Gregory Sekulich from the Canola Council of Canada, and we're going to talk about pollinators today. We're at the Farming Smarter Conference in Medicine Hat. So, what did you talk to producers about? Uh, well, actually, today was a little bit more, um, a little bit more specific, and it was a little more uh, honeybee related than uh, than general pollinator related, and that was basically just a guide through the different terms, terminologies, and. Uh, uh, scenarios and situations that bees in particular are commonly described by in, in mass and, and uh, social media. So uh, delineating I guess between colony collapse disorder which is something that we don't actually have in Canada, uh, winter kill which is something that frequently happens in Canada up to uh, well in Ontario over half their uh, colonies died over winter last year uh, and 46 percent in Manitoba in 12-13. Uh, in uh, but just really want to delineate between colony collapse disorder, that winter kill, and then the kinds of problems we have in Canada, which tend to be more, um, which which tend to be more management related. So when we have agricultural kills of bees, it tends to be acute, and it tends to be from a product that is inadvertently sprayed on them or exposed to them in some way, uh, be that escaping dust at seeding time or drift during application or uh, you know a widespread region-wide infestation of a, of an insect that we need to go in and spray a lot of acres for. Those are the areas and the situations where we tend to see more bee kills. Um, and just to, I guess, um, further expand a little bit more on the uh, neonicotinoid situation, uh, what neonics actually are, where they're used, what their role is, uh, more really to educate growers and the agronomists and even the general public who are in the audience, how to delineate between these different uh, causes of bee death and uh, what the different solutions are when they're reading these stories or hearing them on TV or, or in the papers. Yeah, because something like this, I would say is probably becoming increasingly more important now because you can start yeah. a Twitter fire like that and the implications yeah. now are that that rolls over into a reactionary kind of stance yep. and you get banned yep. or things that aren't necessarily well thought through. Exactly. Uh, and it can all really lead back to a misunderstanding of some of the common terms uh, that we're using, uh, industry jargon. Uh, we really lose sight of the fact that the things and terms that we're familiar at, at, with and use on a daily basis aren't used in the general public. So um, I, I guess that would sum up my presentation today was uh, trying to guide through the sea of jargon and let people understand what the actual issues are. Do you see this kind of thing as um, being a real benefit to producers in that, in that sense? Um, the awareness or the insects in general, or both? Both. both. Uh, the awareness is obviously is extremely important, uh, and that's actually something that's really optimistic to me in the last, well, 15 years in this industry, just how much that conversation has changed. Um, as a summer student in the uh, 90s, <laughs> um, we didn't talk about beneficial insects, except maybe to remind the, the sprayer applicator, you know, don't hang your booms over top of the beehives. Uh, that, was, that was really it. Uh, and now that we have you know, a little bit more data and a little bit more awareness and the conversations are actually happening, we get growers actually asking if they can subtract beneficial insects from their uh, accounts when they're sweeping for ligus bugs or uh, cabbage seed pod weevils or birth army worms or, or you name it. Um, so the fact that, that growers are interested and, and are wanting to preserve these uh, natural species and a, a large proportion of which are quite beneficial to us is, is it's certainly encouraging and it, it makes my work worthwhile on a day-to-day -day basis and I really enjoy that. Um, but now just the perception of, of them being worthwhile uh, is really starting to translate out into some facts in the field as well. So we're seeing uh, more data coming out of um, the field trying to quantify exactly what benefit these insects do have. Um, and in, the, in particular honeybees, we are aware of some fairly large magnitude yield responses that we can get in particularly canola. Um, we probably ballpark it between um, like, like 5 to 15%, I think 8% is, is in one of the fact sheets is what, uh, what, we, what we could reasonably expect from a field scale. Um, and realistic stocking rate of honeybees. But that being said, we could probably use a whole lot more because a lot of the studies that were done to quantify or any yield increase the honeybees have 
uh, are done at much higher stocking rates than are even possible in Canada. Uh, we, we don't have enough beekeepers to, uh, to, to stock at the rates that would be required for these larger magnitude yield increases. So a lot of that uh, differential is actually made up uh, by native species. And the, there's some very interesting work that's just starting to get done. Um, and I'm trying to winnow my way through as much of it as I can that just shows the value of leaving some natural areas in close proximity to like within 700 meters of, of cropland uh, specifically for canola now and the kind of yield increases that we can see from it and uh, is actually being worked back into a uh, dollar per acre return and there are some substantial yield gains that would actually pay for a grower to leave areas untouched uncultivated undisturbed uh, leave some of those fence lines low spots, uh, treed areas, grassy bluffs, uh, places that are safe havens and repositories for a lot of the native species that, um, that are present and that are doing some, some good work for us. And not just from a direct yield perspective with the uh, dozens of species of, of native pollinators, uh, bumblebees, uh, solitary bees, wild bees, hoverflies, uh, moths, butterflies, you name it. There's hundreds of species that, that, or dozens, sorry, of species that can act as, as pollinators out of the hundreds that we could find on any given field in Canada. Um, and a lot of these habitat zones, habitat corridors and uncultivated areas are actually the home for a lot of our um, beneficial parasitic wasps. And parasites and parasitoids tend to be extremely specific to the insects that they uh, parasitize. So we really want to make sure that we're leaving a place for them to complete their life cycle in a non-crop year so that when we put that crop back in again, uh, the parasites are there to attack the pest species and hopefully keep them below uh, economic thresholds. So is that the kind of message that you're putting out to producers is that it really does pay to, to leave room for these native colonies? Yeah, um, that's the message that we're really starting to uh, hope gain some traction is that, it, that um, maintaining some uh, biodiverse uh, habitat on their farms can actually contribute to the bottom line in a meaningful and significant fashion. Exactly how much uh, is what we're in the process of quantifying, but in the meantime we do know that it is not harmful um, and from a, a, a species richness diversity it even provides habitat for uh, game species, uh, a number of which could be uh, considered in decline, particularly now my uh, uh, <laughs> my hunting roots are coming out here, but sharp-tailed grouse are uh, very specific about where they breed. And as we take out fence lines and take out uncultivated areas, that's less and less breeding grounds for them. So this is, this is really an opportunity for producers to show uh, their willingness to steward the land, uh, not just for their own gain, which is certainly, which is certainly present and on, in the process of being demonstrable, uh, but also just for, their, for the richness of the environment around them. So we talked a little bit too about, earlier we talked about Economic yes. And how important yep. Can you just go Yep. Uh, that's probably the first pillar of integrated pest management that we talk about on a regular basis. E economic thresholds. Um, we don't want to spray an insecticide until the damage that the insect does is more than the cost of control. Um, and that's what the economic threshold is. That's not the, the point where you lose a crop. That's just where the the cost of controlling that insect uh, becomes less than the damage they're doing. And we've got pretty decent data for most of our pest species. And really, remember, we only have a dozen or like a handful of, of pest species that are of concern. And your average farmer is not going to see all 12 of them or 13 in a given year. Uh, they're going to see, you know, maybe two or three at most. Um, so we want to make sure that any species we are spraying for is above a level um, that's going to, to cause economic concern because any, we call them prophylactic applications of insecticides, and that's preventative or, or sub-threshold. Uh, the, the damage that they do to the native and beneficial insects is uh, far more catastrophic than the, uh, than the pest species. Um, I think it was Scott Mears said that, we, that to the best of his knowledge, we've never sprayed away a birth armyworm outbreak. It's actually the natural controls that, uh, that eventually end the, 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 the severe outbreaks. And we really need to let these natural controls do their work. And the first, the first means, the first thing we can do is uh, make sure that any insecticide application we're making is above those threshold levels. Do you see producers responding to that? Yep, yep, by and large. Um, by and large, we do. Uh, lots of questions, lots of uh, comments, lots of chatter about uh, threshold levels, threshold numbers. We get those questions every year. Uh, we do these videos every year for uh, specific species and specific pest problems. So that message is, is being taken home partly out of the concern for the insects, but also for concern of the bottom line. Uh, any, 
anything spent in field that isn't required is a waste of money. So producers, particularly farmers, usually aren't keen to waste money. Um, so knowing where they can save a, a few dollars that's not needed, particularly with an insecticide that for an insect that isn't doing enough damage to warrant the application is a, a way to pick up a few dollars an acre quite handily. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome.